Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome back to the last installment of the undergraduate seminar. This is going to be an introduction to ray tracing and fractal geometry by Young Chen. Young volunteered for this. I'm really, really glad to have someone in this last week. Young, take it away. Just so hi, everyone. So today I'll be introducing the due to the role of ray marching. So in this talk, we will first learn about the general principles of ray marching and how it works. And then we will look into the many techniques used in ray marching to, to like enhance the visual appeal of your the graphics you render. And then finally, we will look into how to use those techniques to render some more visually complex geometric shapes and sceneries. So let's first look at what the, the common What's up? Oh, sure. So first up, we will look at what other rendering techniques there are. And the first thing, so exhibit A, we have rasterization. And this technique basically renders everything on your screen as a triangle. And since your graphics card is very optimized to do that, it's really fast. But one issue with this is that since if you want to like render a sphere like here, you can't really render it perfectly with a triangle, you can only approximate it. So that's one downfall of rasterization, since everything is just an approximation of what you want to show. And in exhibit B, we have ray tracing, which is where you, for each pixel in the screen, you bounce a bunch of rays out of the camera and you check if they hit a light or not. And if they do, that would be, that pixel would be lit. Otherwise it would be like a shadow. So for this, for ray tracing, it does create some really realistic, graphics, but one issue there is that since your since the entire basis of ray tracing is the rays, it can be quite difficult to find the intersection of a ray and whatever shape you have. So for example, if your shape was like more complicated than a sphere, like what that table there, you might, you might have a difficult time finding where the ray intersects and where to bounce it off of. And this goes to, this leads into our topic of ray marching, where basically instead of using triangles or using rays, we march each. So for each pixel, we march a ray out of this, out of the origin of the camera. Well, it's kind of like ray tracing, but not really in the sense that we don't, we don't check the intersection between a ray and whatever geometry your scene includes. So the general principle of remarching is that is that follows. So from your starting point, typically the location where your pixel originates from your camera, you move forward some distance and you keep doing that until like some stopping point. And if if you hit a jama, if you hit the, so if your ray, if your ray march ray intersects to intersect the geometry, then that would be counted as a hit. So you would color that appropriately. For example, if you want to make your geometry black and everything that misses white, you could do that since you would know whether or not your ray march ray hits or not. And one thing to note here is that when we when we check if it whether or not it hits, we only consider the points, the individual points here, and not the lines in between. So we move this point to there, to there, and then we march it. So like it's marching forward. And what this is, and how this is different from ray tracing is that you're only considering the distance from your point to the geometry and not the entire line to the geometry. And that little difference makes, uh, helps, and that little difference helps make some, 
make rendering more complicated things a lot easier. So now that we have the general principles down of remarching down, the question comes with how do we decide how far to move? And one popular algorithm, algorithm to decide the distance is sphere tracing, which is so starting from your origin, you would move the distance from your origin to the scene. So whatever distance that is, you move that distance forward. And imagine, so pretend the camera is pointing to the right. So you move that distance forward and then you continue doing that. Like here, you move that distance forward and then you repeat until you hit the geometry. <coughs> so now this also poses another second question. How do we know what, how far to move? Mm -hmm. Since we, since we know that we need the distance, but so to get this, we would need to use something called a sine distance function or an STF for short. And this is an STF is a special function that you pack given a three point in space. It returns the stereo distance between the point and the closest scene in the geometry, like here. So let's say, so for, the ordinate here, the SEF return the distance from here to here. And one thing that's special about the sine distance function is that it's signed, which means that, let's say from looking at this diagram, so the distance from here to here is positive. But let's say, what if the origin was inside the geometry? Then that would give you a negative distance. And that part is important for some techniques in ray tracing that relies on the negative components. So let's start with how we get an SDF. So the first, so probably one of the simplest SDFs is that of a sphere. And this is given by, and this SDF is given by the length of your so let's say the SEF of a sphere is centered around the origin, then that would just be the length of your point that you're evaluating the at, that's here, it's minus the radius of the sphere, so here. So this would give you this distance. And if you check, you see that the negative and positive works. So like when it's outside the sphere, this will be a positive if the length is greater than the radius. But if it's like somewhere inside the sphere, the length will be less than the radius and that would return a negative distance. So you see that this, so you see that the SEF for this works. And now let's look at another SEF. And that is of a rectangular prism. So here I have simplified it to the 2D case. So just a rectangle, just so that you make it easier to understand. So one thing to note is that your rectangle is symmetric across the x-axis, across like the x-axis and the y-axis. So that means that if we just map every point like here to the corresponding point here, then we then we can we only need to consider the the distance of your function in this region here. So basically mapping. Things so like quadrant two, quadrant three, quadrant four into quadrant one, if it was a Cartesian quadrant. And you do that by just taking the absolute value of your points. Okay, so now let's look at, let's analyze the three cases for our SEF. So the first thing we have, let's name them R1, R2, and R3. For R1, your point is above your rectangle. R2, your point is like on the corner of the rectangle. And R3, your point is on the right of the rect rectangle. Mm -hmm. So in R1, we have that the distance is the point, the y coordinate of the point minus the width. So if this was the width, and your point of here, then be the, be the y coordinate minus the width. Same thing for R3. 
we have the x coordinate minus the length. So p dot x minus l. And for R2, we just take the length of the point of the vector from the corner of your rectangle to the point given here by the square root of p dot x minus l plus p dot y minus w squared. So what we notice here is that in the formula for R2, you can find the formulas for R1 and R3. Since here we have p dot x minus l, and that is the distance for R3. And for here we have p dot y minus w, that is the distance formula for R1. And if we try to write R1 and R3 into the form that R2 is, so something squared plus something else squared, we get this here and this here. So just zero squared. And what you also notice is that the zero would be p dot y, so like for R1, this will be p dot x minus L. And we notice that in this region, L is this length and X is here. So that would mean that L p dot X minus L will be some negative. So what if we just made both of these non-negative by taking the maximum of the like here p dot X minus L, taking the maximum of p dot X minus L and zero, and doing the same for p dot y minus w and then squaring that. So what this gives us is a generalized distance formula for all three of them, mm -hmm. which is given by this formula here or in like pseudocode. It would look something like this, where the max is the component wise max. So taking the max of p dot x minus l. P mm -hmm. Well, now that we have the distance here, but one thing we note that this is taking the square root of something. So that can't be negative. But remember that your SVF has to be negative when it's on the inside. So what we can do here is subtract the, so subtract the negative components. So like adding whatever this component here, if it's negative, which gives, which is given by this formula here. And I guess it's kind of hard to understand, but just bear with me. So the zero code will look something like this. And now let's move on to the ray marching algorithm. So our algorithm is as follows. For each pixel in your screen, you at the starting point, you will move the point forward by the distance between the point and the scene. And then now that you have moved the point forward, you do that. You check again the distance and then you move that forward. So after move, so you repeat that for like some finite number of times since your computer can't run it, can't run that whole infinite number of times. So after your distance is like some number very close to the scene, then you can break out the loop. And let's say we color that pixel black. And if distance is like very far away, then you also break out the loop because that's like, obviously you won't have anything that far away unless like you made it, purposely made it. So, and let's say if it doesn't hit anything, you color the pep that pixel white. So let's look at what we get here. So for the first example, we have a sphere. So this is a rain march sphere. You can see that if it doesn't hit, then it's white. If it hits, it's black. And we also have a second example, a rectangle. So you can oh. see the outline of the rectangle here. If it hits, it's black. If it misses, it's white. Cool. So well, now that we have these two sep these two shapes, but one thing we notice that is that they have to be in your separate like images. We can't combine them just with what we know now. So let's find a way to combine these. <coughs> and to do that, so to take the union of two shapes, we would take the minimum of their two SDFs. 
so the distance is given by the minimum of your first, of your first STF and the second STF. And we also have more. So like in this diagram, we see how it works. You march forward and you take, by taking the minimum, you would always, you won't interest, you will always take the outside edge of the geometry. And the second example we have is intersection, which is this region here. So which, so the region that they intersect. And by, to do that, we take the maximum of your SEFs. So from this diagram here, we can see that for a point that's outside the rectangle, if we take the maximum, we march forward here, and then we stop since this region, it would be negative, we'll have negative SEF. And same thing here, we march forward, march forward, march forward. We pass through the circle and we hit nothing. And for right here, we march forward, we pass through the circle and we hit the union of, we hit the intersection of these two SEFs. And we also have, have a difference operation where we take the maximum of your first SEF and then the negative of the second SEF. Now to visualize how this works, if your first SEF was this, was this rectangle and your second SEF was this circle, then if you take the negative of the circle, then the area in between, the area already contained by a circle would be positive and the rest would be negative. So essentially you're taking the union of this rectangle, you're taking the maximum, so the intersection of this rectangle and this, the region is not enclosed by the circle and which gives you something like this. And let's look at what these look like. So for the union, we, I added three shapes here. So you would have something like this. So for the intersection, we have the intersection of a rectangle and a sphere. And for the difference, you can see that, that if you take a chunk out of a sphere, out, chunk out of a sphere out of the rectangle. Cool. So now one thing you might have one thing you might have noticed in our examples is that these aren't at the origin. But for our SDF, SDFs, we assume that they were at the origin. And the way that we translate them is by first, by like translating by the inverse and then trans and then evaluating our SDF. Like for example, if the origin was here, you move and it was pointed this way. If you wanted to move this box down, so like if you want to move this box down, then you would move, actually, if you want to move this box up, then you would move the point you evaluate at down some point. So let's say this was our SDF, we march forward and we march forward and we hit here. Now, if, if you go back to your origin, we were pointing this way and we travel like, let's say this distance. So if we travel the same distance here, we, sell, we see that we hit the box here while in our original SDF, it was, on the bottom. So in our rendered image, we would have your, so like from our example, in our rendered image, this would, you would be able to translate these SDFs out of the origin into whatever position we want. And now let's get into making everything look better because everything is just black and white now. So to add, so to add some lighting, let's look at how we can make the regions. We can make the position pointing. To, we can make the surface that points towards a light, a light choice brighter than the darker one, and brighter than the, than the surfaces that point away from the light source. And to do this, we can use the gradient function to first find a normal. So this vector here. And since we can't really, we're not really interested in solving the actual, and finding the actual derivative, we can estimate it using a very small 
using your derivative formulas and just using a very small number for h to get an estimate for the gradient, which gives you the normal. So is everything the gradient of the SCF? Okay. Yes. Okay. So this will be the gradient of the SCF. So let's say if that was A and B was the position. So if you hit here, then you can just do light, the position of the light minus the position you hit. So the direct the vector towards light will be your B. And by taking the by taking the dot product of these two, you you would be able to so like for the regions that face the light, since this angle is smaller, then your dot product will be larger. And for the factors, for the factors for the normals that face away from the light, this angle will be larger. So your dot product will be smaller. And if we assign, if you use that smaller or larger dot product to assign a brightness to the surface, we would be able to simulate the light. And now the second topic, now to make things look even better, we can try to simulate shadows. And for this, we just need to, so when we hit the point, we just need to ray march towards the light source. And if, so like from here, if we see that if it reaches light source, if it doesn't reach light source, it hits the surface, then that, that region, that point would be in the shadow. So we would color it whatever color we want the shadow to be, so some dark color. And if it doesn't hit the light source, if it like, no, if it doesn't hit the surface and it goes and reaches the light source, then we would consider that region to be in the to be in the light and color that appropriately with some brighter color. So I example here. So if so, so let's say so in our example, the light is somewhere above our image. So like for the point here, we march towards light. If it hits the surface, then it, it's in the shadow. And otherwise, we consider it in the light. So now one thing, this isn't quite accurate since if you look at actual shadows, they aren't, they don't have hard edges. So the way we can do this is if we look at, if we take the minimum distance, so let's say go back to your diagram, if so like when we ray march back to your light, if it doesn't hit the geom geom geometry, but it's like a yeah, point very close to your geometry, then we would assign it, then we would use that minimum distance to assign some like interpolation between the bright and the dark. So this is given by, and if we do that, we see that we can get some soft shadows here. So instead of the harsh shadows we had before. And so yeah, as a comparison to before, we had this. And now we have our soft shadows. So another thing that we get for free from remarching is that we can add a simple glow effect. So just like the soft shadows, if it comes very, if your ray comes very close to the geometry but doesn't hit it and it like bounces off into infinity, then we can triplicate your whatever color your coloring your miss, the rays that miss with some glow color. So. And this we can see as an example given by here. So we add a little, so the red is the minimum distance between the rays that hit and recentness and the geometry. Right. And now let's get into something that makes ray marching very, a very powerful rendering system. Mm -hmm.
So let's say what, yeah, so now let's go back to here. So let's say we had your origin and your SEF. Now, what if we, so when evaluating your points, we saw that we can do the inverse transform to like move it somewhere. But what if instead of like translating it, we, did, we took the modulus of it. So the remainder after division and so looking at this example, our origin is here, we bounce forward. So this is as expected, we see this sphere here. But what if we bounce somewhere that extends beyond this sphere? We start here, we bounce here. And because we're taking the modulus of our coordinate system, we go back to our beginning point, but somewhere lower and then we go continue. And then we hit some surface here. But since that has traveled further distance than this, it will look like something like here. So, if, so a sphere that didn't already exist in our SDF. Now, hopefully that makes sense because let me show you. So this is just a 2D example where you get to see that you can like kind of render infinite spheres, circles. But if we extend it into 3D, we get something like this. So by just taking the modulo of your coordinate system, we can, we can render this pretty easily with ray marching. And I don't think this is possible in ray tracing. So that's already one plus for our render technique. Super cool. Yeah, you could you could do other clever things if you can kind of make different geometries this way. Right? So this is a kind of like uh you, uh, yeah, geometry of torus. So you go through one face, you come back up, and you could instead of a module, you could have a reflection or something. And or you could have a module and a reflection. So you go in one face, you come up the other. That's super cool. That's neat. And that's oh. an inflection in uh, the topic, <laughs> next topic. So let's say if we were, so we can also remap regions in our space to other, to like another region. So let's say if we had a point, if this was the X plus Y equals zero plane, and if we had a point that was below it, so like this blue area, then if we take the negative of that point, so like for each point that is below it, we just take the negative, of it and it maps back to this white region. And the same thing for the red one, we take, if it's below this plane, we take the negative and it goes back up. Same thing for this turquoise one, except there's a few more reflections involved. So, and like, we can see that we can get pretty interesting results. So this is something I came up with like in five minutes, in two minutes, just reflect, just adding random reflections to it. So this gives us pretty interesting results. Now, if you had a bit more time, you can get more intricate stuff. So like something like this, which is still, and this is, we can, and this, and all of this is just a box and a cone. So this isn't any like complicated geometry. This is just made up of our elementary SCFs. And another example is, so this is just a cube that is getting rotated and reflected multiple times, which gives some pretty interesting results. Right. So extending it to the final part of the topic, which is visualizing fractal geometry. And for the purposes of this talk, let's just consider anything with detailed geometry, geometric structure at any, min, at, at, at any scale, no matter how small, to be a fractal. So, as, so no matter how far you zoom in, there will always be some complicated geometry. And we're using this definition because we're only concerned with how it visually appears since this is computer graphic and we're just looking at stuff. So our first, first fractal that we will be studying in is the Sierpinski pyramid, which is a 3D version of the Sierpinski triangle. 
So we can see that this, so let's just look here at the terpene C triangle. We can see that it's just created by taking the midpoints of this big triangle here and making them into you know, smaller triangles and repeating that over and over again. Now this will be, now, of course, this doesn't give us a sine desist function for our pyramid, but we can take advantage of how we use the midpoints by going over for getting a algorithm for how to find the distance from any arbitrary point to your pyramid. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so let's go over the algorithm. So given your point P, so for each iteration in the serpentine pyramid, which is like how many smaller triangles you want to have, you find the closest vertex to the pyramid from the point P. And then you scale that pyramid's vertices by a factor of 0 0.5, so half by a factor of half around the closest vertex. And if the closest vertex is within some distance, some very small distance, then you can from, if that closest vertex is within some within a very small distance from your point, then you will mark that point as being part of your Sierpinski's pyramid. And so the pseudocode might be a bit hard to understand. So let's go with a visual example. So let's say, so like starting from the vertex vertices, we have these three vertices for the first iteration. So we start with the three edge vertex vertices. And let's say this orange point was at the point we were trying to find the distance to. Then if we scale the so we see that the closest point is here. So then we can scale it down. So scale down. So we scale the vertices around the closest point. So the closest point remains still, but these two edge points, they go up here. And this one goes here, just like this. And we see that this top point is still the closest point. So then we scale again around the top point. So then these two edge points go, these two edge vertices go closer. And now that we see that this vertex is the closest point, so then we would scale around that vertex. So this top point moves down a bit, and this one moves left, left a bit, kind of like this. So essentially what this algorithm does is it finds the closest vertex to the point. As you can see here, so after it really saw all of these vertices, it finds whichever one is the closest to the point. And if that vertex is, if the distance between that vertex is very small, that means then we can consider that point to be inside the geometry of your pyramid. So that's, so we'll mark that as being inside the pyramid. Otherwise, it would be what a, a miss. So whatever color you want to painted as when it misses. And this, I know this might be a bit difficult to understand still, so yes. So just as a visual example, this is some, what we would get when we use this algorithm to render our certain experiment. So let's move on to the second fractal that we'll be studying, which is the Menger sponge. And this is, and the Menger sponge is this 3D shape here, which is kind of a 3D generalization of the Serpinski carpet given here. So one thing, so when we, if we want to find an STF for this shape, one thing we want to keep in mind is one thing we might note is that this is how this is basically a cube with some like regions cut out of it. And looking at those regions, we can see that it kind of forms a cross shape, like here. So, so like for the center region, we cut out a cross from your rectangle, from your cube, then you get this shape here, and then we can scale the the, we can scale the crosses down 
And if you recall, we can use the modulo operation to like repeat it infinite times. So we can repeat however many times you want to repeat the cross however many times we want. Now what that gives us is, is like your infinite array of crosses. So like here, so you get an infinite array of crosses. And if you scale it appropriately, you just, you can take all of these crosses and remember, remember our difference operation. We take the difference between the cube and the cross and the array of crosses to get our serpent, our manga sponge. And the final result is given by this example here. So, and remember that we can also like incorporate our other space, our other operations like folding space or reflecting space or rotation. So like in this example, they implemented, they implemented that into their mangrove sponge. So we can see that it generates some pretty interesting geometry by just adding a few rotations and reflections to the sponge. And here's another example here where they basically use the module operation to generate an infinite sponge and then just piece them together and, and did an appropriate animation to traverse through the sponge. So then you get this result here. <coughs> and that's kind of it for this talk. We can so. So one last thing, let's just look at what other things are possible with ray marching. And those being, so there's this one here, they rendered a snail. And all of this, all of this entire thing is made of sign distance functions. So just to show how powerful this technique is, there's also this. Takes more. Yes. Kind of like yeah. So, and this technique uses other things that we haven't covered, like a noise function to randomly generate the terrain and also some stretching and also like adding the trees here, which are just spheres that were like reflected and rotated just like our sponge to distort their shape. Yeah. So there's also this, which is uh -huh. another fractal geometry shape that's generated. And this is like a mega sponge instead of cubes, it's spheres or something. Yeah. Cool. Wait, I'm blown away by how short all the code is. It's 2,000 characters of code. And it's not a lot of code. And it's like 150 lines to generate up just this. Because you only need to generate the base case, and the rest can be done with modular. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. That's pretty cool. Then we also have like more fractals here, where we apply some lighting and so. Yeah, these are like super-duper like Euclidean, so hyperbolic. That's sweet. Shader toy is magic. And this. So for the first three examples, this was this guy was the one who made this book sense. So oh oh the person who the he that's the person who made shape. Yeah. That's uh -huh. a to pull the belt here, so shape tool. Cool. So we also have some here like this. Now that kind of concludes our talk. So from this, you should be able to get how remarching works and what an SCF is and different techniques of using it to manipulate space. Now, if you want to learn more, one useful resource would be, we saw that person's website, 
So they have a ton of resources on how to remarch. And like, in, like here's tutorials and stuff on how everything works. And that's it. So any questions? That was very cool. Uh, yeah, uh, questions from people online. You see, but Albert and Mike Cavers. Uh, could you show the basic very much? Algorithm side. Mm -hmm. So it goes, so for each pixel, you know, this is usually handled by GPU. So in our code, we only have from this part to this part. I think I forgot one step from here. Which... Right. So when, so when does, distance change at all, okay. either distance or distance traveled. Yeah, I forgot to include that. Okay, yeah. So this would be something, this would be what it actually looks like. So okay. direction, RD. So, and this is distance from the image. So, and this is our very origin. So the point that we're evaluating at and that, that point moves forward. So for each point, our origin is added to our mm -hmm. times of distance. And this is our total distance traveled, so that if it's like a number, then we break out the loop. Cool. Yeah, I think in your pseudo code there is distance versus distance travel or something. Um, cool. Oh, so 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 um yeah, I, I might have missed um uh, how 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 you how you uh, march so if my if my yeah so if my distance from the object is let's say 1000 centimeters do i basically march so do i advance but uh, only at a fraction of uh, that 1000 so maybe let's say 500 and the next time it will be it will it will be two two hundred fifty something like that. So if I would, it, yeah if I want the fraction to be one half. So you would march the distance from your origin to the scene. Yeah. Yeah. So like if the scene was something like this, this would march across around this and move forward. So it gets the distance from the point to the scene, and it keeps going forward until it hits. Yeah, okay, so how, so so I, I so I sometimes march for a sometimes advance for a smaller distance, sometimes advance for a larger distance. How is that determined? So the second circle is smaller. And so the so the circle kind of shows like distance. So yeah. If we put, plug in this origin point here, then we would get the radius of the circle. Yeah. So like Distance from here. So then, you know, this direction oh. of our camera, so the direction we're looking at. Oh, but oh, but you are advanced, but you are advancing at, at, at a direction you already have chosen. So yeah. some so when you so sometimes you will okay, okay, I see. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, now I see it. We always start the computer SDF assuming we are in the center of the object. Uh, it's just easier to compute. And, and then we do the inverse to yeah, translate. Can translate. Okay. I'm curious how you got into this topic. How did this, how did this whole thing come to be? 
and so on. Kind of like I was like making my own like game thing with a 2D game engine. Mm -hmm. And like I needed to use OpenGL, which involved like me writing my own shaders. Mm -hmm. So like I kind of like looked at up how to find them and discovered this website, mm -hmm. which like had some pretty interesting things that weren't like remotely related to what I was working on, but <laughs> so then you under the very much. Yeah, cool. That's uh so yes, yeah, so this is like a personal interest thing because you were trying to write a game engine. Yeah, cool. Shade tutorial is really cool. I, I look forward to playing that with us. Um, yeah, I, I have a colleague who gave a talk on Raymark. So one of the one of the other nifty things about Raymarching is this standard distance or the um, sign distance function. Uh, you can make it kind of dependent upon the geometry that you're using, right? So all your stuff is the Euclidean distance, mm -hmm. but you could be like hyperbolic distance or like some other weird or spherical distance or something. So you can render non-Euclidean stuff with ray marching in a way that you can. Yeah, so mm -hmm. if we use the different type of systems, we'll be just assuming we're in a non-Euclidean space. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you can generate really cool pictures of non-Euclidean things. Um, oh yeah, yes, non-Euclidean geometry. Um, I think. I I yeah, so 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 with no, you if you can do that, um, so you can you can render uh which and visualize hyperbolic geometry. Yeah, so that means I can I can find it. We can finally visualize entire digital space. Yay! There you go. Yeah, yeah these are people marching hyperbolic things. I guess. Whoa! Weird. Um. Yeah, yeah, this is a very powerful technique and it's cool. I I think I learned something. I, I think especially the ability to hold space is really cool. That like the, the code is so close to the unfolded version, right? You're like, oh, I can render a sphere. Oh, now I can modules. render this. Yeah, just take modules. I don't even thought you could space. Like that's really, really, really powerful compared to um ray tracing. Because ray tracing you have to set this kind of scene, but with ray marching, you're just like add one line of code. And now you have this infinite scene. Yeah. It's like that's pretty, pretty cool. Um, awesome. Well, thank you for giving this seminar talk. That was great. We uh, this is the last one. Yeah, we ended on a high note. Not very many people, but super duper cool topic. Yeah, Albert's clapping. Um, so I'm going to be reaching out to potential speakers uh, to set up a seminar that starts in May. So we'll have a summer seminar that goes throughout that people will finish their exams. You'll all get copied on that email, but yeah, we'll go through the summer, May to August. I've got about half the spots already filled. Um, yeah. Thanks again. It was awesome. I'll stop the recording here. Um...